So I'm talking about what is on its face a rather lofty concept of democracy and the rule of law, but uh, I'm trying to ground that uh, by always linking it back to the work of EDO New South Wales, and hopefully the reasons for that will become clear as we go along. A lot of the things that I'm talking about uh, are obviously complicated notions, and the story in itself is a complicated one. So I'm just doing a uh, deliberately a schematic overview of some of the issues. As someone who uh, rarely is able to speak in less than uh, 15 minute intervals, I'm using a cinematic device and giving you the conclusion first <laughs> and then we'll work out how we got there. I think it's fair to say that notions of democracy and the rule of law occupy a contested space. EDO New South Wales has been involved in that contested space for the past 12 months, but it's also true of EDOs in the past and governments in the past, that the work that we do um, has often been brought into question. We are not a lobbying group, we're not a campaigning group, but the nature of the work we do, being public interest environmental law, is by nature being relevant. And that means working in the areas which are often high profile and often highly contested. At the moment, that is definitely in the area of coal mining and coal seam gas, but it wasn't so long ago that we were working uh, almost reservedly uh, in the area of, say, native vegetation reform. And it's not difficult to imagine that a lot of our time will be taken up in years to come with things like the planning reforms in New South Wales or the reforms to the Murray-Darling Basin system. So it's the area and the nature of the work we do and we can't apologise for being relevant and playing the role that we do. Recent funding principles developed by the Attorney General reflect that one element of this tension, and I'll show those um, shortly. Community support for EDO in New South Wales, which when we were forced to go public about our funding dilemma, uh, really helped to uh, save the organisation reflects another dimension and a very grassroots um, democracy coming to play and saying, actually, we value the work of an organisation like EDO New South Wales. And finally, dr drawing it all together, and the most important part um, of the presentation is I want to show at a theoretical and a practical level how the work that we do, which I can, if I can... Uh, uh, use the shorthand of public interest environmental law, um, promotes a number of democratic processes and ends. So where we're at, access to justice in New South Wales, and perhaps I think this is probably the most important slide because it does reflect on the work that we do. In the short time available, we won't, really won't be able to come back to this in any detail. But this is, in short, the funding principles which were developed by um, the government late last year. The, the principles are that funding should be primarily directed to casework and in particular for casework for socially and economically disadvantaged groups. Now, as a side note, we don't only do work for social and economically disadvantaged groups. A lot of the work we do is in that space, but we define the work we do in terms of the public interest. In many respects, our, environment, our, our client is the environment. It doesn't matter who the client is as long as it meets those tests. Funding may be used for other functions, including um, outreach work, policy work and so on, although that doesn't seem to be given the same status as casework for socially and economically disadvantaged groups. Funding may not be used for lobbying activities, public campaigning or providing legal advice to activists and lobby groups. Funding for legal representation uh, should be subject to a means and merits test and finally you should need to take into account the public interest and they've defined it in the way they have there. Now just very quickly, some of those issues are on their face potentially problematic for the practice of EDO in New South Wales. Let me just take one because the time is limited. Funding may not be used for providing legal advice to activists and lobby groups. I would say that any organisation which is incorporated on its face would be a lobby group. It would be the Sydney University Academics Action Group 
who, uh, whose mission is to protect the environments of Sydney University. I would say that that's their object under the Constitution and that they would be classified as a lobby group. None of this is defined further, I should say. But just, uh, uh, just to point out that level of uh, what's problematic about the funding principles. Now, quickly, I want to take you on a, a very uh, brief history of EDO New South Wales. As I said, we don't lobby or campaign. We're a community legal centre that practices in the area of public interest environmental law. We're non-government, we're not for profit, but we do receive government money. We get uh, around 12% of government money from state and federal governments. We also receive a large um, degree of money from the Law Society, which is the Public Purpose Fund. And there are other EDOs around Australia, but they're all independent. So where do we come from? This is relevant, it's not a history um, talk, it is relevant to what, 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 where we're going with this. Um, the EDO was established over 30 years ago uh, on the basis of planning reforms which were made in New South Wales. Before the current Planning Act, which we're currently reviewing, and the Land Environment Court, we had a system which was characterised by complexity and politicisation. If you wanted to get something solved, you generally either paid for it or you in, or sought to get a green ban imposed. Um, so the system was beset by corruption, or allegations of corruption, and, uh, and politics on the other side. Neither of those uh, are very viable solutions in a democratic society. And certainly the rule of law doesn't have a great place in that system. So Neville Rand introduced a set of reforms which were premised on the need for community consultation and participation and also the need to take into account the public interest. After 12 months of those reforms in 1980 being in place, the EDO was born. So they realised that there needed to be a body to facilitate the community's involvement in the planning system and also to argue for the public interest before the Land and Environment Court. It's really no more or less complicated than that. We have evolved as an organisation. In the early days, the EDO only did law reform from a public interest perspective. Uh, we didn't do fact sheets, for example. That was considered too controversial. Now, every mainstream law firm will do um, fact sheets and provide those kind of education services. And today, we define ourselves as a multidisciplinary legal office that does policy and law reform, community education, litigation and advice, including scient scientists on board. Um, and that litigation and advice can be either judicial review, which is shorthand for administrative law, uh, it can be merit appeals, uh, or it can be third party enforcement, for example, in the area of pollution. And we also do work in the Pacific region. Another way of talking about that is that we protect the environment through law. That's our central mission. We make decision makers more accountable. We run test cases. We provide expert advice to government. I've been involved closely in the, in the uh, planning reform process in New South Wales for the last 12 months or so. Um, and we build the capacity of the community to engage. We go out, we do outreach, we tell the community about the law and we tell them about their rights under the law as well as their responsibilities. And again, we do the work in the Pacific. So all that boils down to one, this slide, which is about the relationship between the work that we do, the rule of law and democracy. So another way of putting that is to talk about the role for public interest environmental law. That's the, the, uh, the area that we work within. Firstly, as David said, the work that we do promotes equality before the law and that's one of the elements of environmental justice. Just to take two cases that we've run that have, that have uh, been in the uh, media in the past couple of weeks, Walkworth, which was a challenge against Rio Tinto, Merritt's Appeal against the expansion of a coal mine, and George's River, which was against the pollution of the George's River by BHP, a long-running case that's gone for over five years. Both those have been described as David and Goliath type battles. And we have that key role in balancing um, the system and giving community groups uh, their day in court. Obviously that's closely related to the idea of access to justice. Now that may, may be something as prosaic as giving people phone advice. Invaluable as that service is, 
um, but it's a pretty basic one where we tell people um, whether, in fact, they have legal rights and if they do, what those legal rights are. If there's a public interest matter, then we'll take it further and either provide a written advice or we will, on the, the odd occasion, take the matter to court. We also promote access to justice by going out and telling people about the law. In the last three years, we've done nearly 100 workshops in rural and regional New South Wales. That's a pretty strong commitment um, to the work that we do. In the past 12 months, most of those have been in the area of coal mining and coal seam gas. And again, that's a reflection of what people want to know about. Um, as I've said, in, in past times, we were going out telling people about water reforms or native edge reforms or whatever it is, but it's topical, the work we do, and it's got to be, and it deservedly so. The work that we do also promotes public interest jurisprudence. Now, we don't have time to go into that, but uh, with the Land Environment Court, one of the tenets of setting up that court was to take into account the public interest. It's all about providing justice as expeditiously and informally as possible. And the court has taken that very seriously over the years. We've been a key, key player in pushing our idea of what public interest jurisprudence means. People, any person in New South Wales, has the right to take a matter to court. Now that's quite an extraordinary legal right that we hold in New South Wales that very, other, very few other jurisdictions hold. But also, as Justice Tui once famously said, there's little point in opening the doors to justice if people cannot afford to go through them. So there's a whole series of legal mechanisms which have been put in place over the past 25 years with the support of organisations like us and others to make that access to, to, to the courts uh, a viable thing where people can afford to go uh, before the courts. One of those, incidentally, um, has been the provision of legal aid for public interest environmental matters. I found out today um, that there will no longer be legal aid for environmental matters in New South Wales um, because of the cutbacks to legal aid in New South Wales. The work that we do also promotes environmental justice in itself. Now, I haven't gone down the path of the uh, dicey path of trying to define environmental justice. Elements of environmental justice, I would, I would think, would be caught up in notions of access to justice and providing that access to the courts. But if we can think of it in these terms, that, access to ju that environmental justice at least has two dimensions. On the one hand, there's a whole bunch of procedural entitlements around your ability to go to court and to have your say. And that's things like being able to, any person can go to court, um, that there are costs orders that apply to public interest matters, that you don't need to give um, large damages undertakings and so on for uh, those matters. And there's also issues of substantive environmental justice. And those, more recently for us, have been around a number of cases we've done on Aboriginal cultural heritage, and also particularly in the Hunter, around public health issues around both air pollution and water pollution with coal seam gas. It's also true, I think, that the courts reinforce representative government, and that's another way, really, of saying that there, there is a, a clear role in a democratic society for holding decision makers to account. And we, of course, are an organisation that helps to achieve that. Um, the most famous example of that recently was the Catherine Hill Bay case, where we were successful in arguing that the minister had what was called apprehended bi uh, bias, um, insofar as he, he was the decision maker about a particular proposal up in Catherine Hill Bay, um, but it also signed a memorandum of understanding and a deed with the developer to use all his best endeavours to make sure that development took place. So there was a con clear conflict of interest and the law upheld that. It's also clear that our work ensures accountability in decision making. Often the cases that we run are um, those high level uh, high profile and sometimes controversial cases, but they can also be cases where we're, we're seeking to change the way that decision makers um, do the work that they do. So it could be councillors, for example, making those decisions. 
And finally, the work that we do also helps to inform citizens of issues. And the example I can use there is the, the, um, the, the dear example of the Cult United Brewery site, where we lost, and I won't go into the detail of the case, but we lost handsomely. The court threw it out saying it was under what was called Part 3A, um, and uh, it was under Part 3A because the whole point of those new laws were to facilitate and fast-track major developments. We lost on the law. It was in the media the next day, um, highlighting the fact that for developers of the Carlton United Brewery site, there are a set of rules which were less onerous than would apply to you or I doing a renovation to our house under what's called BASIC's principles. So the, the, the case managed to expose that, that uh, uh, ridiculous set of affairs um, and in fact the developer sat down with the community after the event and said, I develop in New York, um, London and Tokyo and I can't do that, what I can do here in Sydney, so I want to make this the first six star development in the, in the uh, Sydney CBD and that's currently what he's in the process of doing. There's ways and means of winning, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, I'm not sure whether I've gone over time or I'm right on time, so this. Uh, without restating my conclusion, um, I just wanted to spend a few moments to talk about the importance of the work that we do and more generally notions underpinning the rule of law in a democratic society. Thank you very much.